Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ Happening Live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers, and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the Praise world. Praise the Lord. I welcome every one of you to our Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. For those who have not been coming regularly to our Bible study, our Bible study is what we do every week. And we do that every Monday. And we thank the Lord you are here tonight to participate with us. And we pray the Bible study tonight will be a tremendous benefit spiritually to every one of us in Jesus' name. And we're praying that as you partake of the Bible study tonight, you will continue with us in a Bible study session every Monday, your location in Jesus' name. We're going to rise up now as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study. Thank you for all those who are connected with the Bible study tonight. Thank you because we want to enrich our lives with the study of your word. Because it is the study of the word that gives us backbone in our Christian life, as well as in our Christian ministry. And we thank you because of the heritage you have given us in this church. Always to come together, learn from the word of God directly. And we pray as we come together tonight for this Bible study. Great will be the knowledge, the experience, the impartation to every life in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that today you give us a taste of the deep well of water that we find in your word and you quench our thirst and you help us to be the man, the woman, the boy, the girl we ought to be for the glory of God and for the extension of the kingdom of God on us in Jesus' name Amen. Thank you Lord because we know you have answered In Jesus' name we pray Amen. And everybody said Amen. Amen Thank you very much You can sit down we're in Jonah chapter 4. And this is the last chapter of Jonah. It's also the last Bible study in the year. In the new year, by the grace of God, we'll be going to a new series of study that will enrich everyone. Open your Bible to Jonah chapter 4. We're reading from verse 1. But he displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tashish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil therefore now O Lord take I pray thee my life from me for it is not it is better for me to die than to live 
Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what will become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a guard and made it to come up over Jonah and that he, that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad for the guard. But God prepared a worm. When the morning rose the next day, and it smote the guard that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me than to die, than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the God? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou art a sad pity on the God, for wheat for the which thou hast not labored, neither made to it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? That's the story we're looking at tonight. And I say, Lord, in that story for you and for me, you remember Jonah? God called Jonah. And God said, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And then Jonah went the other direction. Then there was a storm. And that storm eventually landed him inside the whale, inside a big fish. Then he prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord delivered him. And then the fish, the whale, vomited Jonah right at the point where he could go to Nineveh. And the message came once again, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching I give thee. And his message was quite simple and straightforward. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Then the king of Nineveh, and the people of Nineveh united together, and they repented, and God did not visit them with judgment anymore. In chapter 3, verse 10, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil, that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. That's why Jonah became angry. The whole population of Nineveh had been converted. They turned to the Lord in repentance. The Lord forgave them. But what was the reaction of the man that God used to bring such a great salvation, such a great deliverance, and such a great liberation to the people that should have perished? He was unhappy because of what the Lord had done. And you will see that over and over and over. There's something that comes up. That is the anger of Jonah. Look at chapter 4 verse 1. But he displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Verse 4. Then the Lord said, Doest, well, doest thou well to be angry? Verse 9. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the God? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. 
we're considering this attitude, this emotion of anger coming from Jonah. Now, generally, what's the cause of anger? You see, the case of Jonah is very clear. Something did not go its way. He didn't have his will. He didn't have what he expected. He expected Nineveh to be overthrown, to be judged, to be destroyed. But God spared Nineveh. So then, number one, the cause of anger. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, 1 Samuel chapter 20, I'm reading from Bastati. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of a perverse rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion, and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? Saul expected David to be at the table, so he could throw a javelin at him and kill him. And because things did not go his way, he got angry. Whenever you are angry, and what a shame that you are angry, what's the cause of your anger? Because things do not go your way. Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, I'm reading to you from verse 10. Daniel chapter 2, verse 10. The cause of anger. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 10, then the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asked such things of at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it's a rare thing that the king requires. And there is none other, other that can show it to the, before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with the flesh. For this cause the king was angry and very furious. He had a dream. He forgot a dream. He wanted somebody to come, of all the wise men, to come and tell him the dream that he forgot. And there was nobody that could do that. Because of that, he got angry. You get angry when things don't get through in your way. The cause of anger. Number two, the cruelty of anger. The cruelty of anger. You see in Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 25. I'm reading to you there from verse 5 all through to verse 10. Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousands and captains over hundreds according to the houses of their fathers throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them 300,000 choice men able to go for to war that could handle spear and shield. And he hired also 100,000 mighty men of valor out of Israel for 100 talents of silver. But there came a man of God to him saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee. For the Lord is not with Israel to wait with all the children of Ephraim. But if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God has power to help and to cast down. And Amaziah said unto the man of God, But what shall we do? For the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel, and the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Then Amaziah separated to which the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again, wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah. And they returned home in great anger. 
This man did not check off from God and he employed them. He hired them. And he said, you'll go with me to battle. And then they followed. Then the man of God came to the king of Messiah and said, these people, God is not with them. They do not have the presence of God. Now that you have the promise of God, if you go with them, and then what shall I do? I've given them money. They will not return that money back to me. God is able to give you more. Send them away. And he sent them back. When he sent them back, then they became very angry. What was their reaction? Verse 13. But the soldiers of the army, which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with him to battle, fell upon the cities of Judah, from Samaria even to Beth Horon, and smote three thousand of them and took much spoil. They killed innocent people because of the cruelty of anger. Number one, the cause of anger. Number two, the cruelty of anger. Number three, the condemnation of anger. The condemnation of anger anger. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 22. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, empty-headed fellow, in non-entity, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. That's the condemnation of anger. Number four, the consequence of anger. The consequence of anger. When you get angry, and you get angry over and over and over, what's the consequence on yourself? Job chapter 12. In Job, Job chapter 4, 18 rather Job chapter 18 verse 4 he teareth himself in his anger he teareth himself in his anger have you heard of people that suddenly had stroke have you heard of people that suddenly had heart attack they tear themselves apart they destroy themselves with that burst of anger he teareth himself he destroys himself he makes himself sick by his anger, in his anger. And shall the earth be forsaken for thee? Shall the rock be removed out of its place? Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger rested in the bosom of fools. Anger rested in the bosom of fools. When you destroy yourself, you hurt yourself more than the people you are angry at when you manifest that bursting, fiery emotion that is called anger. Number five, the cure from anger. You need a cure. You need a deliverance from anger. The cure from anger. Proverbs chapter 19. In Proverbs chapter 19, we're well, in verse 11. The discretion of a man defies his anger, and it is his glory to pass over transgression. It is his glory to pass over transgression that you used to excuse the people that offend you. When you excuse them, and you put a better construction on their offense, then you are defining, you are delaying your action. And then when, how do you delay your action? Somebody has done something. And you tell yourself, I don't know all the details. I don't know the how and the why and the shortcoming and the underneath and the things underneath the action. Let me wait for another 15 minutes and think through. And then after 15 minutes, let me wait another 15 minutes and think through. While you're waiting and waiting and waiting, eventually the whole thing might evaporate and you kill yourself from the anger. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, 
and he that ruleth a spirit than he that taketh a city. Number six, the companionship with the angry. What happens to you? when well, you become a companion of, angry, of an angry person, a companion of a boisterous person, a person that is fiery, a person that is, is wearing his emotion on his sleeves. What happens to you if you're a companion of the angry? Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24. Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, thou shalt not go. In Proverbs chapter 21 verse 19. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 19. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Number seven, the command for the angry. The counsel to the angry. The command and the counsel to the angry. Psalm 37. In Psalm 37, verse 8, cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Cease from it, cut it off, turn away from it, stop it in your life, don't let it continue. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Let all bitterness for any reason why you hurt yourself, you kill yourself, and you are pinching yourself, and you are destroying yourself. Let it go. All bitterness, all wrath, all anger, all clamor, all evil speaking with all malice be put away from you. Replace it with kindness and be ye kind one to another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Now we see that we really need to deal with anger anywhere it is found. Deal with it before it deals with you. Kill it before it kills you. Remove it before it removes you away from the earth and solve the problem of that anger before you dissolve completely. I divide the study tonight to three parts. Number one, resentment for the multitude's conversion. Resentment for the multitude's conversion. Number two, rejoicing because of momentary comfort. Rejoicing because of momentary comfort. Number three, Reasons for missionary compassion. Reasons for missionary compassion. Number one, resentment for the multitude's conversion. Let's come back to Jonah. Jonah chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 1. Jonah chapter 4 from verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. And repentest thee of the evil. Therefore, now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what will become of the city. He, was, he had resentment, resentment because of the forgiveness, because of the conversion, because of the grace, because of the favor that God has shown unto the Ninevites. 
Are there other people that when sin has got converted, when wicked people are forgiven, when backsliders are restored, when those who have wasted everything they've got before, when they have mercy of God and the grace of God and the salvation of God, again, and there are people that have reacted in a negative way and they had resentment. Yes. And what did they do? Number one, they have complaints. Look at Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, we're looking at verse 28. Luke chapter 15, verse 28. And he was angry. I will not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said unto his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou gavest me not a kid that I might make merry with my friends, but as soon as this thy son was come, which has devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. Number one, he had complained, just like Jonah, complaining against the mercy of God, against the grace of God, against the forgiveness of God, against the conversion of those who repented. Other people, look at Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, we're reading from verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, and come down. For today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, He was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. They had contempt. They looked down on Zacchaeus. And they even looked down on Jesus Christ. How could you show favor to such a man? How could you give forgiveness to such a man? How could you give salvation to such a man? How could you be friendly with such a man? They are content. Have you ever acted like that? When you think the favor other people are receiving, that favor should have come to you. Why then? And then you look down on them, you belittle them. Let's now see in John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Those who had resentment because of the conversion of multitudes of people. In John chapter 11, verse 43. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus says unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. A multitude again getting saved, getting converted. What was the reaction of the religious leaders? Verse 46. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. And one of them named Caiaphas being the high priest that that same year said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Do you see that? 
they had something against him. Now, conspiracy. Why did they have the conspiracy? Because they didn't like the combustion of the multitudes. Number one, complaint. Number two, contempt. Number three, conspiracy. Number four, Acts chapter 11, verse 2. Acts 11, reading from verse 2. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised, and did each with them. You see, Peter had gone to the house of Cornelius, and these people in the house of Cornelius, they have been born again, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. And the people, even the believers, they were not joyful and happy just because of that. The concern they had was that Peter went and he ate with them. They were taking their nationalistic attitude instead of the Christian attitude. And what did they have? They had in their own mind contention. That's exactly in verse 2. They contended with him, contention. Because they were resenting, they were opposing, they were unhappy about the conversion of the Gentiles. Number 5, Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, I'm reading to you from verse 43. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Do you see the attitude here? Here is contradiction. And why the contradiction? Not because Paul was wrong. Not because Barnabas was wrong. You know why? Because they didn't appreciate the multitude coming to hear the word of life and the word of salvation. Therefore, they envied, they contradicted, and they blasphemed. Contradiction. Number six, Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they, were, they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake, and so spake, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Do you see that? They were jealous. They were envious. And again here now, they had condemnation. They were, making, they were condemning the preachers. They were condemning Paul the apostle. Don't mind him. Don't listen to him. It's not as good as you think. It's a man that has lost his, his sense. It's not a real Jew. It's not telling the people about circumcision. Con condemnation. They condemned him. But did Paul run out of town because of that? You know there are people, if they have opposition like that, if they have condemnation like that, if they have contradiction like that, contradiction to the message they are preaching, contradiction to the word of God they are presenting. And there are some people that react against what they are preaching. They run out of town. They cannot evangelize again. They cannot preach the gospel again because some people are against them. Look at verse 3. Long time therefore. Long time therefore. What's the meaning of the therefore? In verse 2. Unbelieving just touch up the Gentiles. And they made the minds of the people even affected against the apostles, against the disciples, against the brethren, against the ministers and the members. 
because of that long time therefore you know what that means paul said we even wanted to spend about two weeks and go away if everything had been calm and quiet and as the people received the word of god if there were no opposition two weeks we are gone but now even because of that opposition we're going to stay and long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the lord which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands you learn a lesson from there that when people oppose the gospel and when people oppose you and when people contradict you that's not the reason to run out of town that's not the reason to leave your post that's the reason to stay there and stay put and long time abide there and face the storm let me remind you again take the initiative out of the hand of the opposer and then stay there long time and preach and then we're told in acts chapter 15 acts chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 1 acts chapter 15 verse 1 <clears throat> Acts chapter 15 verse 1 And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses ye cannot be saved when therefore paul and barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them they determined that paul and barnabas and certain other of them should go up to jerusalem unto the apostles and the elders about this question and being brought on their way by the church they passed through Phenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they received of the church, they were received of the church, and of the apostles and elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Here we find another thing, a controversy arose as a result of these people doing the will of God and doing the work of God and the conversion of many Gentiles. That's what you'll find. If you're waiting that in your work for the Lord, when there is no opposition, when there's no complaint, when there's no contempt, when there's no conspiracy, when there's no contention, when there will be no contradiction, when there will be no condemnation from men, when there will be no controversy, you'll never do any work for God. But when the storm is raging, and when there are people that do not appreciate the conversion of the multitudes, and yet God is using you, you forge ahead, and you move on, and you keep on in that job, in that work of soul winning, of evangelism, of the missionary work the Lord has committed into your hand. Don't mind their complaint. Don't mind their contempt. Don't mind their contradiction. Don't mind their conspiracy. Don't mind their controversy. Keep on in the work. Even Jonah himself, you have seen him. He didn't have the right vision, the missionary vision. He had a short-sighted vision. And because of that, he was angry when the Lord had done that great thing in that land. I pray that we will not be like that in Jesus' name. Amen. That when we see sinners repenting, and Gentiles coming to the Lord, that you'll not say any negative thing, you'll not act in any negative way, you'll not behave in any contradictory manner, but that your action 
and your behavior and your character and your attitude and your emotion will support the work of God and the conversion of the people. Let's go to point number two. Point number two, rejoicing because of momentary comfort. Rejoicing because of momentary comfort. God knew how to deal with Jonah. The Lord raised up a guard. And then that's a large plant. And then it overshadowed Jonah and gave him momentary comfort, momentary shadow, momentary shade. The Lord was trying to teach him a lesson using visual aids. And the Lord at this time, as he gave him the shelter and protected him from the scorching heat of the sun, he was very glad, very happy. He had more interest in the plant than in the people of Nineveh. His mind was centered on material blessing rather than on spiritual blessing. He was glad for the gift, but he was not concerned to give glory to the giver. Any wonder then, the joy that he derived from the provision was short-lived, very, very brief. At the, time, <coughs> at the time of Jesus, there were people that followed Jesus because of material blessings. Let's come back to Jonah now. Jonah chapter 4. In Jonah chapter 4, we're looking at verse 6. And the Lord prepared a guard and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the God. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day and it smote the God that it withered and it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said it is better for me to die than to live Do you see that he had a momentary comfort because of that physical convenience and then he was very happy and very glad you know some people their emotions move with the weather if the weather is cold they feel cold when it's hot they feel hot and their temperature will be hot and when things don't go their way then they're all ruffled and all disorganized and then when you make them happy a bit they become like an angel and then when something do not, does not go right again then they change from the attitude of the angel and then they change to a person that is you know angry and you cannot even live with them that was jonah because of this temporary comfort he became just temporarily happy and there are people like that that's why the lord is telling us that when those temporary things come don't put your mind on them in proverbs chapter 23 verse 5 proverbs 23 verse 5 well thou set thine eyes upon that which is not for riches certainly make themselves wings they fly away as an eagle towards heaven riches wealth prosperity money property temporarily they are there and then you forget yourself and you're so happy because of that temporary thing but then eventually it evaporates and goes away what are you going to do then like jonah proverbs chapter 27 verse 24 for riches are not forever provision they are not forever prosperity they are not forever material things they are not forever for riches are not forever and does the crown endure to every generation no luke chapter 12 in Luke chapter 12, again, we're looking at those who relied on this temporary comfort. And then, when everything is gone, their hope is all gone. Luke chapter 12, verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, 
the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully and he thought within himself saying what shall i do because i have no room where to bestow my fruits and he said this will i do i will pull down my bands and build greater and there will i bestow all my fruits and my goods and i will say to my soul so thou hast much goods laid up for many years Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool. God said unto him, Thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. When? Then whose shall those things be? which thou hast provided. So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You see that there are people that the temporary things of life will make them happy. And then that's all the happiness they have. And then the Lord said, thou fool, you have been providing all these riches, riches without righteousness. And then when your soul is required of you today, where will you be? Where will you spend eternity? Job chapter 15. In Job chapter 15, reading from verse 28. Job 15 verse 28. And he dwelleth in desolate cities, in the houses which no man inhabiteth which are ready to become heaps. He shall not be rich, neither shall his substance continue, neither shall he prolong the perfection thereof upon the earth. He shall not depart out of darkness. The flame shall dry up his branches, and the breath of his mouth shall he, in the breath, and by the breath of his mouth shall he go away. Let not him that is deceived trust in vanity, for vanity shall be his recompense. You see that trusting in vanity, in vain things, in the property of this life, the thing that will soon vanish away. That's what happened to those people, the Jews at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 6. Verse 24, John chapter 6, verse 24. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, Master, Teacher, Lord, when camest thou hither? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat the loaves and were filled. Do you see that? Temporary things, passing things, the things that will vanish away, that's what their hearts were on. That's what their joy was centered on. And then in verse 27, Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto life, unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him as God the Father sealed. The Lord is telling us that we need to center our affection on things above, the things that stay the things that last, the things that endure, that those are the things we need to center our affections on. And he tells us, let's go back to Job. Job chapter 20. In Job chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 4. Job chapter 20 verse 4. Knowest thou not this of old, since man was placed upon the earth, 
that the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment the joy of the hypocrite just for a moment it doesn't last the joy of jonah the joy of those people running after jesus after the edge of the loaves the joy of the hypocrite is for a moment and then in verse 6 though his excellency mount up to the heavens and his head reach unto the clouds yet he shall perish forever like his own dung the day which have seen him shall say where is he he shall fly away as a dream and shall not be found yea he shall not be he shall be chased away as a vision of the night then it says in verse 9 that i also which saw him shall see him no more neither shall his place any more behold him you see then those who depend on those temporary things and think about it now these many churches, you know, many times we are thinking, well, the many churches we find in our country here, and we find in the continent of Africa, you'll think morally will be better. No, the churches are not established to make people righteous, to make people holy, to make people have eternal life, to make people prepare for heaven. Why are those churches established? The churches are established generally for healing, for prosperity for riches, for defeating their enemies, for destroying their enemies. Do you see that attitude also coming to our church? That people are not seeking for things eternal and for things spiritual. And that when people really pray, they don't pray much when it comes to holiness, when it comes to righteousness, when it comes to eternal life, when it comes to preparing for the rapture and preparing for heaven. What do people pray about much? Healing, deliverance, riches, job, temporal things. And even sometimes it surprises me in our retreat here. I don't know what takes place in other places. Maybe it's the same. That almost every prayer, every prayer, like now I want to start the afternoon, after the afternoon break, and we come on here, let's pray, let's get ready. Then we touch a little of evangelism, a little of this, a little of this. Then whatever your needs are. And what are those needs? Money, job, prosperity, overcoming this, overcoming that. That's becoming too much. But those things don't last. And we shouldn't center our affection, our desires on things that are temporal, on things that are vanishing away tells us in Job chapter 20 verse 28 Job chapter 20 verse 28 the increase of his house shall depart and his good shall flow away in the day of his wrath this is the portion of a wicked man from God and a heritage appointed unto him by God Psalm 37 Psalm 37 Verse 35, I have seen the wicked in great power, spreading himself like a green, a green bay tree, yet he passeth away, and lo, he was not, yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Let's remember then, all these temporary things that are temporal. And they're going to vanish away. And we shouldn't search our heart, our affection, our love on them. Let's come back to Jonah. In Jonah chapter 4. Now the Lord wants to teach a lesson to Jonah that he ought to have learned. A lesson that you and I ought to learn. And then it gives us the reasons for missionary compassion. Reason for missionary compassion. Let's come back to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4, verse 9. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the God? 
And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. See a man like this talking to God like he was talking. How do we forget so soon? When he had his trouble, when he was in the storm, when he was in the belly of the whale, did you see the way he prayed? Did you see his language and address to God? Did you see the sign of reverence and the fear of God? Did you see his comportment when he was praying to God? Oh God, have mercy on me. He that observes like vanities will forsake his own mercy. I'll be foolish, but now I will pay my vow. I will sacrifice unto the Lord with the tongue, with the mouth of praises. He was respectful. There was reverence. He wanted to get out of his predicament, of his trouble. Now he was out. And the Lord gave him the ministry again. And then he came into the ministry now and see what has happened. And then see the way he was talking to God. Do you do well to be angry, Jonah? Yes, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Is it like that with you? When the chastisement was heavy upon you, and when the rod of the Lord was following after you because of something you have done, were you sober? Were you repentant? Didn't you reverence God? Didn't you say, oh God, if you will accept me back from the way of my backsliding, if you will give me a chance again to serve you, oh Lord, I will serve you. And then after you were restored into that service, what's your attitude? Attitude towards God. Attitude towards the word of God. Attitude towards the ministry that the Lord has committed to your hand. Didn't you go back to the same careless relationship with the Almighty God? That's Jonah. And it's a bad attitude. It's an attitude of being ungrateful. That what the Lord had pardoned him for. And the Lord had had mercy on this man. Now God was having mercy upon the people of Nineveh, but no, he will not appreciate that. And then he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the God, for the which thou hast not labored, neither made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also march cattle? Now, what reasons do we have so that we can show this compassion, so that we can show this attitude of gratitude? unto the Lord. What reasons do we have that God has forgiven us and we ought to forgive other people. God has forgiven us. We ought to make a way, an avenue so that they too, they'll be able to receive the forgiveness of the Lord because we have had the mercy of God. We also ought to make that mercy of God available for other people. That's a reason for wanting to have compassion on the people that are in their sins. Let's look at the word of God. The reasons, the reasons for missionary compassion. What are the reasons? Number one, compassion on the ignorant. Number one, compassion on the ignorant. God said, Jonah, look at Nineveh. There are 120,000 people there. That's made of six score. A score is 20. Six core is 20 times six, 120. 120,000 people there, totally ignorant. And we need to have compassion on the ignorant. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant? Many people are ignorant, ignorant of their salvation, ignorant of the possibility of getting saved, 
ignorant of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, ignorant of the fact that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They are ignorant. That's one of our reasons to have compassion on the people that are ignorant of the way of salvation. Reasons for missionary compassion. Number two, the consciousness of the invisible. The consciousness of the invisible. The invisible one. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 27. It's talking about Moses. Hebrews 11 verse 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. That means it was, he had the consciousness of the invisible one, the consciousness of the Almighty and the demand of the Almighty. I'm asking you, are you conscious of the invisible one? As you minister here, are you conscious of the invisible one? As you serve the Lord, are you conscious of the invisible one? As you go out to evangelize, are you conscious of the invisible one? As you go on missionary field, are you so faithful because you are conscious of the invisible one in the secret place, in the public place where you minister? Are you conscious of the invisible one? Consciousness of the invisible. That's what makes us to endure. That's why we endure. Enduring for the salvation of the lost. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 10. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Paul the Apostle said, I have a lot of things to endure, and I endure them. And you know why I endure them? Because of the salvation of the people that need to be saved. Number one, compassion on the ignorant number two the consciousness of the invisible number three concern for the indifferent concern concern for the indifferent you know there are people that do not know that judgment is even coming they're indifferent and because they're indifferent we we need to have compassion on them and we need to see how we'll make the gospel to reach out unto them in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verses 41 and 42. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Concern, concern, concern. As you hear about the crime in the city. As you see, many people dying, being ushered into eternity without well, being prepared, and being ushered into eternity without salvation. Are you concerned? Are you thinking about them? Does it bother you at all? Or is it just, Lord, give me house, give me husband, give me wife, give me children, give me money, give me this, give me that? Are you concerned for the people who are indifferent? Then in verse 42, saying, If thou art known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things will belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Concern for the indifferent. Number four, consecration with intercession. Consecration with intercession. You see, when you know the, lo the lostness of humanity, and you see the condition of the people of the world. There will be one thing that will be essential to you. And it will be to preach the gospel to the people that need to hear. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9 verse 36. Matthew chapter 9 verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them. Because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd as sheep having no shepherd and now then saith he unto his disciples the harvest truly is plenteous but the laborers are few pray ye therefore the lord of the harvest that he will send forth 
laborers into his harvest, into his harvest. Intercession, pray. You ever pray? Analyze your prayers. Analyze the, analyze the prayer of the individual, the prayers of the family, the prayers in the house fellowship, the prayers in the zone, the prayers in your district, the prayers in the church at large. Analyze them. Do we have this concern? Does it bother us at all? The harvest truly is plenteous and the laborers are few. It's not talking about, we don't have enough coordinators. That's not what he's talking about. We don't have enough women coordinators in the church. That's not what he's talking about. We don't have enough instrumentalists in the choir. That's not what he's talking about. We don't have enough ushers, enough security. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about evangelism. He's talking about the people that are perishing. And he says, the field is ripe. And the harvest is plenteous, but there are not enough laborers to go out and reach out unto them. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. He's telling us then to have consecration with intercession. Number five, communication of the divine interest. Communication of the divine interest. What's God's interest? What's God interested in? What's the desire of God? He's told us, I've read it to you in Jonah. I'll have pity on them. I will have compassion on them. Because they're ignorant. They know nothing. They cannot discern between their left and their right. I must have compassion on them. What is the interest of God? Communication of the divine interest. Communicate it to yourself. Communicate it to your family. Communicate it to your Christian friends. Encourage your Christian friend. Encourage your brother. Encourage your sister. The interest of the Almighty God. What's that interest? Let me show you in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? Says the Lord God. And not that he should return from his ways and live. That's the interest of the Almighty, the divine interest. Communicate that to everyone. God has no pleasure that your neighbors will perish. God has no pleasure that the people around you will perish. Let that be the center of your very heart. In verse 31, cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies. Says the Lord God, wherefore turn yourselves and live. That's the divine interest. He doesn't have any pleasure in the death, in, the, in any sinner perishing. Chapter 33 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33 verse 11. See unto them. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Communicate the divine interest. God wants everyone to be saved. Get involved in it. Reach out to the people. Do it in your community. Do it in your city. Do it in your nation. Do it outside your nation. Do it everywhere. Change your vision, your desires, your interest, your focus, change everything. I've said it before, and it's like the church is settling down. And as if you know what I know, if you see what I see, the concern and the burden, and you know sometimes it's like, why is he doing like that? I told you before, if we took somebody out of the choir, and then we said, please go and lead a local church and be a pastor, the choir will be shaking and trembling. They'll be, they'll be pulling this and pulling this, plugging this and, you know, removing that. Why? Because somebody in the choir, he ought to remain in the choir forever and forever. And to be a pastor and to be a preacher and to be an evangelist and go out and reach the people and communicate the divine interest. No, that's not there anymore. Take somebody from the ushers. Take somebody from the security and say, you be a missionary. Go to such and such a place. Then they begin to imagine. They begin to visualize 
what happened yesterday? Ah, that man must have offended the pastor. And because he must have offended the pastor, that's why the pastor is taking him from being an usher to make him a pastor, to make him an overseer. To make him a missionary you see that attitude because we do not understand the divine interest take somebody here out of lagos just maybe a coordinator or a group coordinator and make him a state overseer and then there's confusion everywhere everything breaks down and then we begin to imagine ah uh, that group coordinator must have offended the pastor there must have been something that went wrong. Otherwise, why will the pastor remove a group coordinator and make him a state overseer? You see the attitude. You see the loss of vision that the Lord is telling us. Don't be like Jonah. Don't be like Jonah. Come out of Israel. Come out of everywhere you are. Come out of the whole of the dungeon where you are. Nineveh is to perish. Go out to Nineveh and go and tell the people of Nineveh, you don't have to perish. There is mercy with God and God will help you. You respond in Jesus' name. Now, if the church now, look up here. If deeper life now were to settle down, choir, stay where you are forever. Ushers, stay where you are forever. Electronics people, stay where you are forever. Drivers, stay where you are forever. Whatever you are doing now, that's all right. Forever, stay like that. Who will become pastors? Am I the only one that will run here, run there? This year alone, from January this year to December, I've been to India, I've been to Singapore, I've been to Germany, I've been to France, I've been to England, I've been to America, I've been to Jamaica, I've been to how many places? And then in Nigeria here, I've been to Port Harcourt, I've been to Calabar, I've been to Benin, and I've been to last week or the other week, about one and a half weeks ago, I was naked to stage. Is it only me? Can I do it all alone? No. Why are we all sitting down? And then if we say, get up and go there, it's like, what did I do? What did you do? What did Jesus do? He died on the cross. And because Jesus died on the cross, that's the reason why we need to go out and tell them, in fact, why do you need to wait for me? Why should I come and pick up on you? Don't you have any dream? Don't you have any vision? Don't you have any passion? Don't you have any something, something stirring in your heart? Why don't you come yourself? I think now I volunteer. If, you, if, if God leads you to make me a pastor, I'm available. If God leads you uh, to make me a missionary, I'm available. Where are they? As large as Lagos Church is. As large as all these choir members are. We are more than 4,000 choir members in Lagos alone, all together. Are we going to just sit down there playing violin and playing trumpet? Who is going to preach? Who is going to declare the word of God? And then when we talk about it, it's like it's talking to the rest of the people. We are not concerned. Of course we are concerned. Because we need to communicate the divine interest. And then he tells us, number, number, four, number six, the condemnation of the insensitive. The condemnation of the insensitive. The people that they, they don't care, it doesn't bother them. The condemnation of the insensitive in Lamentation chapter 1. Lamentation chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 12. Lamentation chapter 1, verse 12. Is it nothing to you? Is it nothing to you? The condemnation of the insensitive, is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by, behold and see, if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord has afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. Now, take those words to be the words of Jesus, that the Lord laid, Almighty God laid, our iniquity, our sin upon him. And then the Lord said, look at my agony. And look at my suffering. Is it nothing to you? What if I came to you? Well, thank God for the few people that are still available. And they are not thinking, well, did I offend the pastor? Where are they, where are they need in one stage? 
And then we had one of our coordinators here. It wasn't even a group coordinator, just a coordinator. And he was working in the bank. I called him. You know, the people were having uh, interviews for this, interviews for that on Saturday at Bagada. And then we had this need there in another state in Nigeria. The state overseer there had relocated and gone outside Africa. And we had somebody there. And I, and I prayed and I thought and I said, Lord, what am I going to do? We cannot leave a whole state vacant without giving them a state overseer. And then the Lord impressed on my heart the name of a particular coordinator in Lagos here. And I was thinking, <laughs> as the church is now, how can you just open your mouth and talk to this coordinator? He's working in the bank. And then I got to Bagada that Saturday. And I went around. I knew he would be there to interview people. And then I called him. I said, please, can you see me in the office? And then he saw me. I said, uh, I think I know you're working. He smiled. said, yes, I'm working in the bank. I said, I'm going to ask you a difficult question. Can you tell me the salary you're earning? And he gave me a big, big figure. I said, is that so? You young person, you're earning so much. I, he didn't know where I was going. I said, you know something? That's a need. God has a need. The church has a need. The kingdom of God has a need. What are you going to do? The Lord is leading me to pick you up and send you to a state to be an overseer. But that money you are earning in the bank, no way we cannot pay you that. The brother smiled and said, he said to us, sir, I will go. I said, will you talk to your wife at home? Oh, he said, no problem. My wife will be in agreement. That's the consecration, the commitment of our lives. Within that week, we settled everything. The brother is now in that state as a state overseer. Don't clap. Don't clap. I'm sorry for you. You clap for other people about you. Can I come to you like that? You are just there. Can I come to you like that? Security people there. Can I come to you like that? All these leaders in the choir, you've been here in the church for 20 years and for 25 years. And you know the whole doctrine. When you preach, when I listen to you preach, you know it as much as any overseer in this land. Can I come to you like that? Can you leave your establishment? Can you leave your company? Can you have the mind of Christ and say, Lord, here am I. And if you're all sitting down there, and if we try to pick you up and make you do something else, it's like the pastor is fighting with us. The pastor is unhappy with us. That's why he wants more evangelists. That's why he wants more missionaries. Who is fighting with you? You don't know who is fighting with you. I'm your father. I can correct you. That's no fight. But the insensitive. The people that are not sensitive to the call of God, there's condemnation. Is it nothing to you? Look at the sorrow of Christ. And look at the passion in the mind of Christ. And he says, I'm looking for somebody. I'm looking for people. Don't be like Jonah. Number seven, the commendation of the industrials. The commendation of the industrials. In Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy until I come. I'm going to, I'll teach you the scriptures. I'll teach you the scriptures. Occupy until I come. He wasn't thinking of choir. There was no choir in the ministry of Christ. He wasn't thinking of ushers. He wasn't thinking of security. Occupy until I come. There was one thing he was thinking about. Evangelize. Win the souls. Bring them in. Go and talk to them. And go and appeal to them. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. Call them. Bring them in. Occupy till I come. I am occupied. I'm in the choir. No, sir. I am occupied. I'm doing something in the church. No, sir. Occupy until I come. He wants you to take the gospel and go and tell the world and go and tell people everywhere Jesus died for every sinner. And he wants you to say, here is my life. I lay it upon the altar. Occupy till I come. When are you going to start? When are you going to start? I have started. I have started. And I go everywhere. Even when my voice is going, yes, I still do it. 
And maybe some of you, as you are listening to me, and you are saying, why is the pastor shouting like this? His voice is gone. How about you there? You have the voice. Are you available? Are you available? I have to shout. Even when I lose my voice, even when things are dangerous, even when it appears no more strength, I still have to do it. Don't you know my age? All the same. All the same. Because I want this work to be done. Occupy till I come. That's why I'm doing it. Instead of opposing me, instead of contradicting me, instead of criticizing me, he has lost his voice. Why all this shouting? Why all this trouble? Instead of all that, why don't you say, look at this man. With no voice, look at this man. Everything is almost gone. Look at this man and he will not give up. He will not even excuse himself. Why didn't he just say, okay, everybody, you understand? I was in the program the other time. I'm in the program now. And you see the condition of things. Tomorrow there will be no Bible study. We're not going to make any allowance at all. Everybody will rejoice. You will not blame me. You will not say that I'm lazy. You will say, well, the pastor has tried, but I will not give up anything. If I will do that, in what way are you going to copy me? In what way are you going to resemble me? In what way are you going to say, like father, like child? This man running up and dying, running up and down. Occupy till I come. I'm going to be like him. Anybody there? I said anybody there. Where are you? Where are you? Will you pray? I prayed. I gave myself to the Lord. I laid everything on the altar. And I said, Lord, my life, my voice, my heart, my talent, my mathematics, my lecturing, my property, my family. I laid everything on the altar. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. How about you? When are you going to start? I know music too. Am I going to just stay on music, music, music? Will music save the people without the preaching of the gospel? Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. And come and lay everything on the altar. And instead of just saying, I about this, I about that, forget all that. And come to the Lord and say, Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. Lord, here am I. Lay it on the altar. Be available. Be available. Be available. Do this work. Occupy till I come. Be ready to preach the gospel. Be ready to preach the gospel. With all your heart. With all your soul. With all your mind. With all your talent. With all your ability. Be ready to preach the gospel. Volunteer and make yourself available. Volunteer and make yourself available. Volunteer and make yourself available. Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. Is it nothing to you that the souls are perishing? Have compassion on the ignorant. Have the consciousness of the invisible. Have concern for the indifferent. Let there be consecration with intercession. And the communication of divine interest. Divine interest. There's condemnation for the insensitive. The inactive condemnation 
for the insensitive, but commendation for the industrials. Bring all you have to the Lord. Bring all you have to the Lord. Your heart, your talent. Your skill, your ability, be available. Be available. Have the mind of Christ. He died to save the lost. Offer yourself. Present yourself to the Lord. Volunteer. Let us know you are available. Let us know you are willing. Let us know you are ready. The call is there for everyone. It's not a call to an easy life. Not because of money. Not because of fastly reward. Be available. There's condemnation for the insensitive. But all that we're saying, all that the word of God is revealing to us, if you are insensitive, there's condemnation. Be available. Offer your service to the Lord. Say, Lord, here I am. I am ready. I am willing. I will serve. 